Okay, our next interview is with Richard Raymer, uh, who is a New Yorker and an expert in uh, Brazilian material in Latin America, etc. And Richard, why don't you tell us a little about, about your background, uh, your family, uh, siblings, education, what your parents did, etc. Let's just start things off. Well, my parents uh, were both uh, educators. Uh, they worked for the New York City Board of Education. Uh, I grew up in Brooklyn. Um, my father was a Columbia University graduate. My mother was a Brooklyn College graduate. Uh, I, uh, I have a bachelor's degree from Brooklyn College, a master's degree in Latin American history from NYU. Uh, cut that. Cut that from, NYU. from uh, Indiana University. And then afterwards, I went on to do coursework for a PhD at NYU, but I started to veer off on a tangent. Instead of teaching history in a university, I got more and more interested in books as objects. When, when did this occur? Well, it started when I was at Indiana University. I met, uh, I met Charles Boxer, who had uh, sold his library to, uh, Indiana, to the Lilly Library at Indiana University in 1960. And part of the deal was that he would spend about three months of each year on campus giving a seminar, and working at the Lilly Library. And uh, I never took uh, the seminar with him, but I, went, I had admired him for many years through his writings. And I went to look him up. I introduced myself. I showed him a paper that I had written. He read it, and he made some very constructive criticisms, including telling me that I should look at Borba de Moraes's bibliography of rare Brazilian books and uh, pointing out to me the importance of rare books in connection with scholarship, which is something that I hadn't thought of too mm. much until that point. Uh, how long did you uh, stay there? Did you stay at Lilly for a while? Uh, I was at Indiana for two years. For two years. While you were there, did you do any book buying or book selling on the side? Well, up, at, at, up until I got back to New York, uh, I had done book buying, but only paperbacks and things I needed or thought I needed for courses. I always bought more books than I really needed, but I never bought an antiquarian book until... I think about 1967, more or less, when I was back in New York. I, I had a Lehman Fellowship to study beyond the master's level, and it paid $5,000 a year tax-free. Mm. And in, at that time... That's a lot of money. That was about what an assistant professor would be netting after taxes. Right. Uh, and I was living at home with my parents. <laughs> so one of the things that I turned the money toward was book buying. And uh, I started to frequent uh, used bookstores on the old booksellers row, which was already in decline, but there was Wait, still... Stop for yeah, a second. Yeah. Could you just talk a little bit about the booksellers row? Um, it's been mentioned a couple of times, but I'd like to have some kind of expansion on it. Talk a little bit about what it used to be. Yeah. Well, I never saw it when it was in its prime, right, but, but it was still hanging on in the late 1960s, early 1970s. There must have still been maybe eight or ten shops that were open, some of them quite with quite extensive numbers of secondhand books. And each one of them, or, or most of them, had a handful of really rare books as well. Uh, and I made a few purchases there, and I 
also saw an ad in the New York Times for a sale at Park Burnett Galleries. And I went up there just out of curiosity. And um, I, I was interested in Robert Southey and his connection with Portugal and Brazil. And, and also Portuguese literature, Spanish mm -hmm. literature. And uh, there was a first edition of Southey's Life of Nelson in the sale. And I was able to buy it, uh, I forget if it was $15 or something like that. And there was also, I looked at a number of other books, and one of the books that I had uh, been attracted to was an Italian translation of Lopez de Gomer's work on the conquest of Mexico by Cortez. And uh, I had already an English edition in paperback form that would serve me just as well as this, but the paper and the binding really appealed to me. Uh, but it was estimated at 100 to 150 dollars, I think. And I wasn't going to pay that kind of money for a book. In the, that was big money in those days. Yeah, right. So, but it opened at 20 dollars. John Marion was taking the sale, and nobody bid $20. So he asked, would anybody bid 10 And I couldn't control myself. <laughs> I put my hand up. But somebody bid 15 But I, I was already hooked. I bid 20 and I got it for $20. <laughs> and there were a number of other incidents of that kind. So that um, after a few years, I began to think about what I was going to be doing with my life and the books the book world appealed to me more and more. Also because I had been at Indiana University about that time David Randall's book uh, Duped Him Large Enough came out and I read that and it was kind of a, another impetus in you know, the romance of the rare book trade. When did you decide that you were going to do this for a living? Well, in 69, I had a couple of shelves of these kinds of books that I had bought, partly because they appealed to me as objects, partly because I thought they were bargains. And I, thought, and I decided I'll put out a list, I'll put prices on these books that, so that it won't hurt so much to part with them. <laughs> like, like the book I bought for, for $20, I priced at 250 and so on and so forth. I put out the list. I put a small ad in the uh, book review section of the New York Times, and I actually had the temerity to ask people to send in a dollar <laughs> to, get, to get the list. Wow. <laughs> but I, got, I collected about $50 from this. To pay for the ad? <laughs> <laughs> More or less, I think. And uh, I sent it out, and a few of a few of the people actually bought books, and and I also sent the list out to some of the major universities, and a significant number of the books were sold. So I began to think, well, maybe there's something to this, <laughs> but I had an awful lot to learn yeah. because at, I had never worked for another bookseller. I didn't have anyone in my family that was in the book trade. I had never worked in a library. I, w I had this subject knowledge from my studies in, in history, but uh, uh, it took me another three or four years to even be considered a knowledgeable novice in, in uh, the book as an object. When did you... Uh become a member of the association? I think it was 1973. Um, and when was your first book fair? Do you recall? I, it was right after that, either 73 or 74. Was it in New York? Was yeah, yeah. Have and, you, you've done other book fairs. And then I did the New York book fair every year, I think from 73 until 1989. 
I'm, I'm not absolutely sure if 73 or 74 yes. was yeah. the first year. But, uh, and then I did the London Fair in the late 70s and early 80s about, not about exactly six times. And I did, uh, I did a fair in Venice in 1986 connected yeah, with the big. ILAB uh, Congress. Well, I, I think I met you and your wife for the first time at an L.A. book fair when we had uh, Quaritch bought us all that expensive breakfast out on the planet. Oh, yes, yes. If you remember that. Yes. I and um, they said... In the old you, Ambassador Hotel. In the old Ambassador. And uh, someone said, why don't you sit next to Richard's wife because she doesn't speak English and neither do you. <laughs> so I thought that was a good way to say it. And, and so it I worked. Did. And it worked. <laughs> We've been friends ever since. Um, do you find uh, the computer to be a friend or a foe? Oh, it's definitely a friend. Can you yeah. elaborate on that, uh, your experience, your business? Well, uh, there are a number of ways that, it, that it's a friend. First, just as a word processor, uh, I, I'm a halfway decent typist, but in the early days before computers and word processors, processors it would take me a tremendous amount of time to write up a letter or a description because I was always, always make mistakes and I have to tear it up and do it over again. With the computer, you don't have to really worry about that. You just look it over and you make, make a change and it's much, much simpler. Yeah, you get your mailing list is on there, your inventory. It's just, it's been a wonderful boom. Yeah. And I, I've also... I, I felt, at, at one time, I felt that it was an enemy, but I learned to embrace it. Well, I think we, all, all of us as booksellers, not computer people, were kind of, you know, a little scared of, of this exactly. whole new technology. Exactly. And, and in the early days, it, it, it wasn't quite as helpful no. as, as it is now as the computers develop more powerful uh, I mean, there was interlock. Was, was the first of the matching services, yeah. and um, that morphed into a Libris. Yeah. Uh, and now there's all these other matching services that are, that are sort of working around. Um, when you first started in the trade, were there any people who were your mentors or people who you would go to for advice, et cetera? Well, I would say that uh, Steve Weissman and... Um, Having one of my senior moments now. We all uh, have. Uh, Steve Weissman of Zimmer. And uh, uh, at Lathrop C. Harper. Uh, um, oh, Doug Parsonage? Exactly. D Douglas oh, Parsonage. What a memory. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he, uh, he, was, he was brilliant. Brilliant. He, and a wonderfully kind man. Very, and, very. And, and very patient with. Uh, Stupidities uttered by uh, well, young you know, booksellers. Lathrop Popper was one of the major yeah. booksellers in the yeah. world, not yeah. just in New York City. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and then in a way, also Arthur Freeman was very helpful. Uh, I met him in Ca when he was still in Cambridge as an agent for Quaritch, and he convinced me that uh, bidding in London sales through Quaritch was a good idea. And uh, over the years, that has paid enormous yeah. dividends. Uh, uh, they give excellent advice, and uh, uh, even even now, uh, it, it's an invaluable aid. Yeah, um, that, that's a whole other subject about auctions and stuff. But um, as you as you've gone along with the computer and the computer world. Um, I think that most of us are on various services. What, uh, who do you subscribe to? The, uh, the, t the two that I have now are uh, AB Books and uh, this, um, the one that was formerly uh, connected with the ILAB that's now... Biblio? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, it, I think it's called ILABdatabase.com now. Something like that, yeah. Uh, but it's no longer officially the ILAB no. uh, 
but but it's searchable by ILAB. Right. So I have my books on the ILAB website. What what that. percentage of your sales are generated by the computer versus what you do on on your normal course of events mm. from the house, from the catalogs? Yeah, and that, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure what Ballpark. the percentage is, but it's a significant amount, maybe. 15, 20%. And the, the, balance, the balance of your sales come from catalogs? Or? Uh, well, I haven't done a catalog, a real catalog in a while, but I've done, uh, li I do lists from time to time that I put up on my own website. Uh, by the way, my own website is also a source of occasional sales. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and... Uh, but, you know, see, you're, you're in a very specialized kind of area. So if people were looking for uh, books on Latin America, and especially Brazil, uh, you would stand out among and, all the and, others. And also, I think that I benefit more from these online uh, services than a lot of people because a higher percentage of my books are books that nobody else has. Right. That's huge. When you go on the internet and see 27 copies of the same book at different prices, yeah, yeah. it can be frightening. Why? But yeah. uh, I think everybody's idea is to have the only copy on the internet. Um, what, what do you think are, are the biggest challenges that we as booksellers face as we head off I think the biggest challenge is just to stay solvent. That's right. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you see the, the customer base that, that we're going to be working with? Uh, I think that for somebody like myself uh, who is interested, I, uh, although I do business with modern books, uh, Portuguese first editions and 20th century and literary magazines, I have to confess that my greatest interest is in older books, and uh, the, there are, I think there are less and less people that are capable of understanding some of the older books. Uh, there are less and less people that are well grounded in history, there are less and less people that know languages, Latin, Greek, French. Yeah, that's, that's true, it's true. Um, what are some of your, uh, when you first started in the trade, what were some of your recollections, uh, early recollections of the trade? Uh, some great finds you may have made, uh, mistakes you might have made, uh, anything that sticks out? Well, I'll tell you about a, problem, a mistake that I made. <laughs> it, it, I, I attended, a, a, it must have been 69 or 70, I attended a, a Plandum, a sale of Plandum book auctions in, uh, in, uh, on Long Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I made, I think I, I don't know, remember if I bought one or two books, but the one book I remember was a, a, a Kidder book, travel book on Brazil and a bookseller with a ponytail came up to me and said and told me that that wasn't such a good purchase that I had paid too much money for the book and it was hard to sell and he was right <laughs> do you still have it no but I had it a long time, a long time. eventually the price caught up, caught up with you yeah um, you uh you are still traveling back and forth between Portugal yes, and, and the States, yes. and you still maintain two residences, and yes, yes. occasionally you issue catalogs out, out of uh, Portugal. Uh, we've done a few okay. catalogs uh, using uh, Julieta's yeah, name. name. Uh, haven't done that in a while, but one of these days we're going to do another one, I think. Yeah, why, why not? Um, when we talk about entering the book trade today, uh, people have mixed emotions. Uh, what do you think of it? Do you think that this is a business that has a future, or do you think this is a business that, that is slowly but surely destroying? 
No, I think it will always have a future. There will be ter tremendous changes, but uh, as a departed friend of mine once said, it's the last of the liberal arts. <laughs> <laughs> Who was that friend? Did uh, he say? Nick Sakis. Oh, Nick Sakis. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it, people, are, people often wonder whether we will survive as, a, as an association. Uh, if you look at our ABAA association, more than 50% of our members are 60 years old or more. Yeah, but I think that while there aren't that many really young people in the trade, there are some, so there are some promising ones, and I think that there will be people entering the trade in midlife, uh, people's uh, doctors, lawyers, businessmen who will get interested in books and at some point decide that they want to have a different kind of career or turn a hobby into a business, as has happened in the past. I think there's a lot of that right now in our association. Okay. Um, when you think about the world we live in today, Richard, who are some of, in your opinion, who are some of the great booksellers that we have? today, <laughs> no. without, without hurting anybody's feelings. Oh, boy. <laughs> Just, you know, I know that there are many. Just name a couple that you think Oh, are, gee. Are but it, uh, I'm really on the spot now because I'm probably going to leave out no, some. No, we'll all leave But, but uh, I think uh, Bill Reese, uh, Rudolf Chaminal, Richard Lann, uh, Nicholas Poole Wilson, uh, There's one generation behind us, yeah. basically. Arthur Freeman. Well, Arthur's, Arthur's in our generation, too. Yeah. Uh, Justin, Justin yeah, Schiller. Justin. But uh, who are some of the young booksellers that you see as, as the future of our trade? Well, there's one that I think is very promising. He's the uh, president of the, uh, the Canadian Association. Um, I don't, I don't uh, um, uh, Eric uh, Washke. Is that what, what's his firm name? Uh, it's know? called Wayfarers. Uh, oh, Wayfarers, sure. Uh, in in Vancouver, and I think he has a shop in Washington State also. And he's very dynamic. He's traveling all over the place. Has a tremendous amount of energy, buying, selling. Yeah, well, energy and money are, are two things that are, go hand in hand in this business. Yeah. Well, if there was one thing, Richard, that you would say to a young bookseller who wanted to go into the trade and came to you and said, Mr. Raymer, I'd like to be a bookseller. Please advise me what you think I should do. <laughs> you would probably say to them. <laughs> well, I think that uh, if they're going into the books, book trade cold, they really do need capital nowadays. It's, it's not easy to uh, a, acquire a decent inventory. Yeah, it was much easier when I started. Uh, ju just to digress a little bit, I, I recall that uh, there were sales at Swan Galleries almost every week of the year. They must have had at least 45 or 50 sales a year of books, each one with 300, 400, 500 books, and there would be really good books in all of the, in every sale. And it was possible for a bookseller like myself to go to these sales, maybe not buy so much, but learn a great deal yeah. about uh, what was good and what wasn't good, and acquire a few things along the way. Now, it's much, much more difficult to build up an inventory. Well, I see that most of the galleries don't want to handle the sort of bread and butter books yeah. that we grew up on. Yeah, yeah. I guess there's no money in that. Yeah, yeah I assume that's true. I've heard that, uh, that, I don't know if this is absolutely true, but I've heard that uh, Sotheby's and Christie's don't want to take individual lots 
for less that are worth less than ten thousand dollars. It used to be less than a thousand. That, that's the way times have changed. Uh, so, what are your plans, Richard, for the next uh, foreseeable future? Are you going to be doing any book fairs ever again? Mm, I don't have any plans to do book fairs. I, I'm a little bit tired yeah. of them. <laughs> you got to that stage uh, of your life. I did, I did a lot of them, and it's much more relaxing. I, believe me, I, I know the feeling. It's much more relaxing. <laughs> but I don't busy. rule it out completely yeah. under the right circumstances. I might want to do it. And I, think, uh, I, I think also another reason for my not doing it is that the dynamics of the book fairs have changed a lot. And uh, while I have maybe a few dozen really great books, uh, you have to have, to really make it worthwhile, you have to have the kind of inventory that some of those people I mentioned before have, that uh, with, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of really... Yeah, critical mass, big critical uh, you know, mass. You know. Well, thanks very much, Richard, for participating well, in the Well, it's program. been a lot of fun. Enjoyed it, and uh, we'll see you around the campus.